Today I want to go over just a really basic introduction to, to viscoelasticity. What I want to focus on just is what, what sort of mechanical behavior is viscoelasticity in general. So let me remind you of some things that we've talked about. The first type of behavior that I think everybody uh, is familiar with is just elastic behavior. Okay, So in elastic behavior, what happens? Well, um, if, if we are in strain-dominated loading, we get load recovery uh, upon removal of the strain. So load recovery upon removal of strain, applied strain, how about? Okay. Or we get a strain recovery upon removal of applied load. Okay, so a strain recovery upon removal of applied load. Okay, hopefully that's pretty straightforward. Okay, so what does that look like if we look at a stress strain curve? Well, there's stress strain curve. In one case, the case we're most familiar with would be linear elastic. So we load up, and when we unload, it follows the same curve. Uh, we would say in this case that sigma is equal to E times epsilon. This is a Hooke's law and we're showing you in one dimension. So we would term that linear, el linear elastic, right? Again, nothing you don't know about before. It's driven by Hooke's law. Okay? The, the only thing this says is that it has to recover uh, and, and uh, when we say removal of the applied load, we're assuming it is instantaneous. So uh, we could have a nonlinear case too. So if I draw another stress strain curve here, and maybe my curve looks like this, I could have a load up and it loading down in the same fashion. I still have stress as some function of strain, but in this case, this is nonlinear elastic. Okay. Sometimes you'll hear it called hyperelastic. Okay, so that's elastic behavior. Uh, then we have uh, plastic behavior or or inelastic. Okay, uh, and in during inelastic behavior, uh, we're going to end up with some permanent deformation after unloading. So permanent uh, deformation uh, upon unloading. Okay, so there's inelastic. And this actually comes in two types. We could have uh, plastic um, behavior or we could have sort of damage behavior. And I, and I mean cracking and things like that. The upshot in terms of a stress strain curve uh, is that we have a, there's our stress strain curve. We load up typically in a linear elastic fashion and we have some behavior that is nonlinear, and then when we unload, we come back and we call this E sub uh, I, that's the inelastic strain. Could be plastic strain, could be damage strain, but in any event, it's some permanent strain that exists at the end. Okay? Okay, so those, th those are sort of classes of materials that you've probably seen before. There's also a class of materials that aren't uniquely defined by their stress and strain. So let's just say some materials are not uniquely defined by uh, stress and strain alone. By stress and strain alone. Why? Because they're going to depend on th other things like uh, temperature. So temperature T uh, and uh, loading rate. Uh, which we would write maybe as epsilon dot uh, or sigma dot. Okay, So that's going to drive uh, the behavior in addition to sort of the stress or strain. So if it depends on temperature and loading rate, it doesn't 
nothing we've talked about in the terms of the plasticity that we talked about or the elasticity that, that you are familiar with really depends on the rate or the temperature. When we have a material that behaves like this, right, we call that material an anelastic material. Okay. And that's really going to be the topic of what, what we're going to cover uh, in the next few weeks here. Okay. Um, what kind of materials are, are um, typically handled in this fashion? Let's just say that often um, uh, this anelastic behavior, so anelastic behavior, uh, is going to be used for polymers. Okay. So it's used to describe polymers uh, near their glass transition temperature. Okay, we'll talk a little bit more about that uh, in another lecture. But uh, glass, glass transition temperature, okay, which we usually write as T sub G. So this is an important quantity to remember. And typically, inelastic material behavior falls into two broad classifications. Okay, so here's the broad classifications of inelastic material behavior. Broad classifications. The first one is viscoelastic. Okay. And in viscoelastic, we're going to have uh, uh, time or temperature dependent response. So temperature dependent uh, response. Okay. But that returns to its initial shape. Okay, so returns to its initial shape um, upon unloading. Okay, but we're going to say dot, dot, dot uh, eventually, right? Not right away. And that has some implications. We'll talk about them. The second broad classification is viscoplastic. Okay, so in this case, it's a time temperature dependent response. I'm going to abbreviate just for speed. So temperature dependent response. Okay, um, but it does not return to uh, its initial shape on unloading. Okay, initial shape on unloading. Okay. In other words, viscoplastic is time temperature uh, behavior that results in inelastic behavior. Viscoelastic is time temperature dependent response that is elastic. Okay. I'll just give you a heads up for when we're talking about things in this class. So in this class, I'm going to continue to use the word viscoelasticity. Um, uh, I'm going to use viscoelasticity to describe basically both classifications. Okay. So I'm, I'm going to use viscoelasticity, but uh, the formulations are going to be applicable to both, typically. Okay, so formulations typically applicable to both. Okay, so hopefully you'll be able to look at uh, both of these cases after after you, you've gone through um, the next few weeks. Okay, so I've, I've given you some definitions. What does an actual stress strain curve look like for this kind of material? So let's say, what is a typical uh, stress strain curve? And in this case, we're going to fix the loading rate. So for some fixed epsilon, or sigma dot, okay, 
what does this look like? Well, let's go ahead and draw it. So here's my stress strain curve. Strain stress. And this let's say this is for for uh, you know a, a generic polymer. And if we consider one case, it could just be elastic. We load up, we come down, right? And you can imagine that if the temperature is really low, right, you, you've experienced this before, then pl the plastics deform exactly in this glassy fashion. So this would be the case for the temperature. Um, it's going to be much less than the glass transition temperature, G TG, and it's going to behave in a glassy manner, which typically we're going to model as linear elastic. Okay? Okay, if we go way above TG, then you can kind of imagine what happens. One of two things happens, actually. So you end up with, let's say, a lower modulus that may or may not be very linear here. And so here's, a, here's my load up. And in one case, I could have an unloading that maybe looks like this. So down, down to this location, this, this curve here, this is going to be T much, much greater than than the glass transition temperature. If we have something that looks like this, where we unload, this is inelastic behavior, okay? Um, in this case, it's gonna be more viscous, uh, and it's gonna be inelastic, so it's gonna be basically viscoplastic behavior, okay? The other thing that could happen is that we could load up on this nonlinear curve and we could come right back down that nonlinear curve. This would be kind of descriptive of, let's say, like a rubber band or something like that. In that case, so if, if we have that load case, uh, this would be what we would call entropic elasticity. Okay. And we would describe this as nonlinear elastic, typically. Or hyperelastic. Okay, neither of these are the topic of these next few weeks, but I wanted to at least clarify. What happens now when the temperature is is near the glass transition temperature? Well, what happens is we load up to let's say this lo location here, but we don't follow the same curve when we unload, nor do we go inelastic we follow a different curve back to the same point. Okay, So here's my load up, here's my load down. This is for the case of T is approximately equal to TG. And in this case, we get a viscoelastic response. OK? So uh, the, the feature here is that we still ended up at the same spot as we started, but we took a different path to get there. Um, so now I want to just briefly mention a kind of a, a key feature here. What's the work that we put into the system? Well, um, so let's say work in is going to be equal to the integral of sigma d epsilon on loading. Okay, so that's going to be the area under this top curve. And then the work that we extract back out are the recovered work. So we'll call that W out is going to be equal to the integral on unloading of sigma d epsilon. And what's going to, what you see is that that's going to be the integral as I integrate back this direction, right? Well, if I, if I ask the question, are these equal, the answer is no. So what that tells me is that I actually have an energy dissipated that is the area, um, the area under in, in between these loading and unloading curves. Um, so we end up with an energy dissipated. Okay. It's just going to be the W in minus W out, as we defined it there. We could flip-flop signs if we wanted to change how we're defining things, but that ends up giving what, us what's called um, hysteresis. When we see when we say hysteresis, we mean that there is an energy loss. Uh, this is the energy dissipated. Okay.
So this is the energy dissipated during that loading unloading cycle. Of course, the elastic case doesn't have any energy dissipated during the loading unloading cycle. Um, plastic deformation, of course, does. But uh, these are just some, some basic definitions. Okay? Now we want to ask the question, um, what, so the, we, in the previous case, what we did was we fixed the rate and we changed the temperature. What if we fix the temperature and change the rate? Change our load rate. So how about a typical uh, stress-strain curve? Uh, but this time we want to say it's for fixed temperature. Okay? And I'm going to just define that. Let's, let's introduce some strain rate, epsilon c dot. That's just some characteristic strain rate, okay? Just for comparison. Okay? Okay, so what does that look like? Well, let's draw my stress strain curve again. It's going to look exactly the same as the, the other case. I'm going to have some region that's elastic. I'm going to have some region let's say that is uh, viscous in some fashion, either either um, entropic elastic, so nonlinear elastic, or, or viscoplastic. And then I'm going to have this region here where I'm going to dissipate energy during a loading-unloading cycle due to the fact that my stresses and strains so are different. So uh, here's my area under the curve. Now the question is, how does the rate affect this? Well. I think intuitively you, you know uh, if the strain rate is very, very fast, greater than much, much greater than some characteristic strain rate, it behaves elastically. If the strain rate is very, very slow, much, much less than the characteristic strain rate, then it's going to behave in this fashion. And in, when the strain rate is approximately equal to the characteristic strain rate, then it's going to behave in this viscoelastic fashion. Okay. We'll talk a little bit more in in in, in uh, upcoming lectures about the physical mechanisms that give rise to this and why um, why this behavior exists. But I just want to, you to be aware in terms of a basic stress strain curve, what kind of behavior that we're talking about. Um, so let's. What does this all tell us? This says that there's probably a link. Uh, between uh, temperature and strain rate, okay? And so that gives us kind of a strategy to solve uh, the problem uh, as we go forward. So the, the strategy uh, going forward is going to be that we're going we're gonna to look at um, the effect of strain rate. So we're going to solve our problems um, as a function of strain rate uh, or stress rate, sigma naught or, or epsilon dot, and then we're going to be we're going to just shift the solutions, okay, uh, to as needed uh, to to get the the solution as a function of different temperatures. So we're going to shift the solutions as needed uh, for changing temperature. Okay, so as, as we go forward in this class, you're going to see me focusing primarily on epsilon dot and sigma dot, and then at some point I'm going to introduce how we can we can basically link back, incorporate the effects of temperature, and, and, uh, and do what's called uh, time temperature superposition, uh, which is a real common strategy in, in viscoelastic materials. So that's sort of the roadmap of the kind of behavior we're interested in solving. We want to talk about how we can develop a set of equations that will let us to do that so that we can predict a material response.